Welcome to But What About Me, a career success podcast dedicated to giving a voice to underrepresented populations or UPs and helping each navigate their career to reach their highest potential. This podcast is brought to you by JenniferTardy.com. Welcome to another episode of But What About Me? I am your host, Jennifer Tardy. And in today's episode, you're going to meet Dr. Ashley Folks, who will probably go on my list as one of the most moving thought leaders I've had a chance to connect with in some time. Dr. Folks gave us an hour of his time providing real motivation and no chaser career advice for the transgendered population. In this podcast, we talked about why the unemployment rate has been so high among the trans population, truly unique obstacles and barriers that this population faces getting to the interview and even after gaining employment. He shares some great advice on overcoming these hurdles. I ask him a few tactical questions about using your legal name versus your preferred name, how to correct an employer if they address you with the wrong pronoun, and what to do if you feel that you've been discriminated against. And we even spent time discussing climbing the corporate ladder, especially when there's no one who looks like you in leadership. Dr. Ashley Folks is a licensed clinical psychologist. His passion for LGBTQ plus sensitivity is palpable and has resulted in him becoming a highly sought after speaker and consultant. Dr. Folks has worked in the field of DNI for the past 10 years. He's been called upon to provide training and consultation to organizations both large and small. His largest client has more than 10,000 employees, while his smallest client has less than 10 employees employees. Dr. Folks is an amazing facilitator and captivates an audience with ease. Whether it be a large audience or a more intimate setting, Dr. Folks always brings the full weight of his expertise to bear. As a transgender man himself, Dr. Folks has a profound appreciation for the impact, both blatant and subtle, of cultural competence and sensitivity in the workplace. Dr. Folks is considered a subject matter expert and provides consultation on the creation and implementation of policies and procedures related to sexual and or gender minorities. Dr. Folks can be found on LinkedIn LinkedIn under Ashley C. Folks. Okay, so here's a quick disclaimer before we dive into it. I'm still getting my microphone just right. But the good news is that Dr. Folks is crystal clear and it's his message that you need to hear overall. Now, as I always state, if you hear something that resonates with you that you know others need to hear, please take a screenshot of this episode and post it to Instagram. Don't forget to tag us at your career success. I loved this topic. You'll thank me later. Let's get started. All right. Welcome to the show, Dr. Ashley. Thanks for being a part of But What About Me? How are you doing today? I am fantastic. I'm excited to be here. I know we've been trying to make this happen for a little while, so I'm glad our schedules have aligned and we can finally have this talk. Thanks for having me. Not a problem. And I've really been looking forward to this conversation as well. And today we're talking about transgender job seekers and employment. So um, let's kick things off. I would just love to give our listeners an understanding of how large of a population is the transgender workforce? You know, that is, that's an excellent question. And it's a little difficult to answer because we have such limited data um, on demographics for the transgender community, um, in part because it's not the type of thing that we track like on the census or something like that, where we can get those hard and fast numbers. What I can say is that our best estimates um, as of 2017 are there that there are about 1 million adult transgender uh, folks in the United States, or about one in every 250 adults. Um, that's a rough estimate, and honestly, it's probably an underestimation because we are limited to collecting this data online. And so older trans folks that might not have much of an online presence are probably not represented very well in those numbers. So you could probably say a little more accurately, there's about a million or so younger adult trans folks in the U.S. 
And so if we were to work back from there and, and try to figure out how much of that is represented in the workforce, we probably have to think about unemployment rates. And our best mm -hmm. guess there, um, the best numbers we have there go back to 2015. So in 2015, the unemployment rates for the United States as a whole were about 5%. And uh, sadly, unfortunately, in the transgender community, they were at about 15% or three times that of the general population. Um, and even worse so if you're black and trans. And so if you're a part of the black and trans community, it was about 20% unemployment rate. So I, I couldn't give you any hard and fast rules around that, but I would say there's about a million young adults um, that are likely either a part of or would like to be a part of the workforce, but we're looking at unemployment rates at around 15 to 20%. So. Well, the way that you answered that was perfect. And it actually leads me to the, <laughs> the next question. Um, when we're talking about unemployment rates and how high they are, I was also looking at an article too about the LGBTQ plus community. And it mentioned that there's an even higher unemployment rate among the trans population, which you just confirmed. Can you give, anyone list some real down to earth idea of you know what the population is up against by way of landing a great career yeah you know i think that that is such a layered question um i think it would be remiss we'd be remiss if we didn't discuss stigma and how that impacts you know the job search process and I think what ends up happening oftentimes, there's things that cisgender folks just take for granted. And maybe I should take a step back and make sure everybody knows the difference between cisgender and transgender. So cisgender, um, cisgender means that the sex that you were assigned at birth is consistent with your current gender identity and who you know that you are. Whereas transgender means the sex that you were assigned at birth is not necessarily consistent with your gender identity. So I think there's a lot of things that cisgender folks um, just take for granted that transgender people run into in the job search process. So, for example, trying to decide or determine at what point um, it's appropriate to disclose that you're transgender, if ever. Um, and sadly, because there is such difficulty at times with being able to change your identifiers on your documentation, you find yourself in a position where you end up kind of outing yourself whether you want to or not it, as early as the application process when you have to decide what name you're going to use on your application um, or if you actually come in for an interview when it's time to give them your social security card and your driver's license is that name consistent with what you applied with on the application um, are your identifiers whether you're male or female on your application consistent with what's on your formal identification and so those things cause gender identity to be right at the forefront oh. at the very beginning of the process oftentimes um, way sooner than a person would like for them to be um, and so then that gives way to whatever stigma there is whatever a person feels about or thinks about gender identity or sexual orientation or their misgivings about those types of things those things come up to the forefront um, you know they come to the fore right away because they're introduced right away, unfortunately. Um, so that's one thing. And then I, I think there's also things that people just kind of don't think about or don't have to think about if you're cisgender, like apparel. Or what do you wear to a job interview? Um, you know, what, what, how do you fashion your hair? Do you wear makeup? You know, should you bind your chest? Should you not bind your chest? And things that you just don't have to think about at all um, if you're cisgender. And so, I think there are definitely barriers to even getting in the door. You know, I'm, I'm cautious not to focus too much on things that are well outside of our control because I think, you know, I'm, I'm one that believes in empowering people and I, I want to give people answers for how they can actually, um, you know, navigate this and, and focus a little less on the things that are outside of our control. <laughs> And so, yeah, so I, th I think that there are some things, though, right out the bat that you have to kind of decide um, when you're even, you know, pursuing uh, employment. And then if you're lucky enough to get in the door, you might find yourself having to deal with some other things once you get in the door. Um, like we have this huge national debate right now going on with restrooms and 
so on and so forth. So first you got to get in the door. And if you can manage to get in the door, then once you're inside, you got a whole other set of issues to deal with. So, yeah. So I know that just in your message that there are going to be so many people that think, wait, wait, that I'm experiencing all of that right now. Like the, the apparel, the binding, like all of that. What would you say to them? So let's just talk about before you get in the door, um, you've made it, um, you've, you've acknowledged some of the things that the trans population may face. What sort of suggestions do you have for them in general um, before you get in the door? Before you get in the door. So first things first, um, I, I, there is nothing, nothing that can take the place of competence nothing could take the place of competence. Um, and I think that we do ourselves a disservice and we do our industries a disservice um, when we focus on things on the periphery and don't do what we need to do to be the best at our craft. So first things first is you need to be the best at what you do. And that's not just with the transgender population, but with minority populations in general. And, you know, as someone, you know, as a, as a black person, I, I remember hearing that growing up from my parents. I mean, my parents would tell me, you know, you've got to be you know, twice as good. You've got to know twice as much. You've got to work twice as hard. And we might debate on whether or not that's fair, but whether it's fair or not, it's kind of a moot point. It just is what it is. You've got to be the best. And so I would say to someone who's transgender, I would have a very similar message. Um, and that's not meant to discourage, but actually, again, this comes back to empowerment. That's something that's completely within your control. You know, we have such access to information now that you can really, really, you know, take the necessary steps to learn whatever it is that you need to learn. You can, you can learn formally, like through, you know, organized higher education, but then there's also just a ton of information online. There's lots of certifications, there's lots of, you know, um, different programs you can go through to be able to show that you have um, the knowledge and the skill set necessary. So I think first things first is competent. Be the best that you can possibly be. Now, I've been really successful in my career. But I've also worked very, very, very hard, you know, um, and, you know, I, I took my education very seriously. Not that education is the way for everyone, but for me, mm -hmm. that was my way out of, um, you know, a really, really tough situation. And so I took, I knew education was the only way that I was going to get out of my current situation. And we won't, we won't go all into that. Maybe that's another podcast for another day, but, but, I'll, but suffice it to say, suffice it to say that when I started college, I was homeless, like literally homeless living in a homeless shelter with my son who was an infant at the time. Um, he actually had his first birthday in the homeless shelter actually. Um, and I was, I was trying to hide the fact that I was homeless. I had two pair of pants and three shirts and I would rotate them and hope that no one would notice I was wearing the same things all the time. But when I started college, I was literally homeless and I knew that if there was any way that I was going to get out of my current situation and, and make a better experience for myself and for my son, education was, it was the only way I was going to get out. And so I took it very, very seriously. I, and I, I, I went to school and I worked because I had to, I had an infant son. Um, mm -hmm. But I took it so serious. I went to school year round. I went summer sessions. I went winter sessions, you know, and I ended up actually graduating top of my class, right? Undergrad graduated. I was at the, the highest GPA in, in the psychology wow. department. Um, and then I was, I went on to grad school. And same thing, same hunger, same zeal, you know, you've got to, you've got to know your stuff. You've got to be the best. You've got to give it all that you've got. And I actually ended up same, same type of thing. You know, I graduated at the top of my doctoral program, top 2%, um, and went on to become the first licensed clinical psychologist from um, my program, which is a historically black university. Shout out to HBCUs. Uh, <laughs> went on to become the first licensed clinical psychologist from our program. So, I, so I, I say that to say I put in that work and there's nothing that can substitute for the work. So like if you're looking for a quick answer of, you know, kind of how do I make my way in the back door? How do I slip through the cracks? I don't, I don't have one of those answers for you. What I can say, though, is that if you put in the work, if you put in the work, it makes it exceedingly difficult for anyone to be able to stop you. Because what happens is if you're the best of the best, like at the end of the day, when it's all said and done, Bottom line rules the show. And, and organizations yeah. want their companies to be successful. They want the best people. And they want the best people bad enough that they're able to kind of 
<laughs> let go of some things, right? So I've worked in some environments where, listen, I don't really think they like black people very much. I'm just going to be honest. I don't really think they like black people. I know they didn't like gay people and trans was like, whoo, you just do it. Like, so I walk in like a quadruple minority. Like I'm just doing way too much, like way <laughs> too much. Like you know, I come in and I'm like, okay, so I'm black. Oh yeah. I probably also should tell you, I mean, like I'm female bodied, right? So then like, so that, that's minority status. I'm married to a woman. Okay. So there's that whole thing. Oh, by the way, I'm transgender. Where's the men's restroom? Like I'm just doing way too much. Um, like, <laughs> but at the same time, I come in with a ton of experience and expertise to bring to the table. And that has put me in a position where people that, you know, I'm, I'm not confused about it. I, I think there are some people that if I, if I didn't step, if, if my reputation didn't precede me, which I'm fortunate that I've worked hard enough that my reputation precedes me, the last three or four positions I've had, I've been actively recruited for. Like they've come to me and said, we want you. So I'm not having to fight that fight. I'm not try- I don't have to do that because I've gotten to a place where people are like, man, we want that person. So they come to me, tie and all, and say, we want you, right? Since my reputation precedes me, I don't have to fight that fight in a way that I would if I was coming to the table, not having put in the work, not having developed the expertise, or you know, um, having settled for mediocrity. And, and so I, I, again, the very first thing is, you got to be the best. You got to know your stuff. You got to, and you have to be internally, like intrinsically motivated. You're not necessarily going to have someone there, you know, right. cheering you on. I mean, you can always come back to this video and we'll be like, hey, hey, you can do it. But like <laughs> the reality of the situation is you're not going to get a lot of that. And so you've got to be hungry enough to get off work and go to work, if that makes any sense. So you got, you got to do it. And you know what? I could probably end the podcast right here and drop the mic. <laughs> I mean, just think about what you're saying, right? You have to be so good that they cannot deny you. Be so good at what you do that they come looking for you and yes. you don't have to go looking for them. That is one of the most powerful messages that, that I think I've heard this year. So wow. thank you for putting that out there. I appreciate yes, absolutely. that. Absolutely. Man, that was good. And then we have to look um, at, oh, I'm sorry. Can I say some one more no, thing? No, no, please. <laughs> please do. And then I, so, that, so that's part of it. I, I think it's kind of a twofold thing. So part of it is you've got to be so good that they come looking for you, right? I think the other part is those of us that have made it inside and have made it to positions that are really difficult to access, um, with minority status or double or triple or quadruple minority status, we have a responsibility to also make way and create space for those that come after us. So there's, a, there's, there's, there's two parts here. So it's your job to be so good that uh, someone will come and seek you out. It's my job to make sure I come and look for you. And that's how we keep this thing going forward, right? It's my job to create space for you. It's my job to not care if you have the correct identifier or not. That's my job. It's my job to say the men's restroom is over there. My job is to create space for you. But your job is to be good enough that I come looking for you. Now, you do your part. I'll do my part. We can make it happen. So. Okay. All right. I like that. I like it a lot. Now, um, so when I'm talking to groups of people about, you know, career advice, one of the things that I always share with them, I want to hear your thoughts on this. One of the things that I always share is when you're going into an interview, um, distractions can take an interviewer's mind off of how knowledgeable, how skilled you are, your experiences, all of that, any sort of distractions, and it's just human nature. Mm-hmm. And so what I say to people is no matter who you are, do your best to minimize distractions so sure. that when you show up, they're asking about who you are, right? They're asking about your knowledge, your skills, your experience. And, and I share with people, you have to be the person that thinks about, well, what could be distracting in this interview? Yes. Now, this, this whole message um, may need to be reshaped as we're talking about the trans population. I yes. don't know. And so I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, man, that's, oh, that's good. So I think it's interesting because when it comes to the transgender population, um, not that this is completely unique. I suppose this is probably the case also for my, uh, other minority 
groups, but your very presence can kind of be a distraction. Um, sure can. And so like you just walking into a space can be a distraction. Um, people trying to figure out um, how they should view you, perceive you, refer to you can be a distraction. So, I mean, I, I think, I think what's probably most important if I were to think about coming into a situation and again, trying to make the case for being given a chance would be to focus very much on your previous accomplishments, your skill set, focus on your background and what it is that you bring. But again, it comes back to you, you gotta be, you gotta be better, right? So you need to know about the organization. You need to not just know about the organization, but you need to know their pain points so that you can speak to their pain points. And that's really, really important when you have minority status, right? Because what, what that does is that draws the attention back to what's most important to most people, which is them, right? And so, that is true. so that is you true. Bring, it, bring it back to them. So there's a reason that they're looking to fill this position. There's a reason that they're looking. There's a need that this organization has. You come to the table able to speak to the need, right? If you come to the table able to speak to the need, then the focus becomes the need uh, more so and less so you. The other thing that I would say is you've got to be, you know, confident in, in your presentation. Um, I think that people get distracted by insecurity oftentimes. And so if mm. I don't feel comfortable in my own skin, my skin now becomes a focus of attention for you, right? Because it's a focus of attention for me. So now we're both focusing on my skin and the fact that I'm uncomfortable in it. Whereas if I come in and I have, you know, a commanding presence, right? And I'm just like, hey, how you doing? You know, welcome, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Then I'm able to put you at ease and we're able to talk about what we're actually here to talk about. So let's, now let's talk about what's most important. And then this is where you bring it out. This comes back to, you gotta know your stuff. You gotta be the best. This is where you come to the table and you say, you know, this is what I understand about, you, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but this is what I understand to be the case. This is what I understand to be the need and a, you know, I'm really interested in this opportunity. This is what I think I could bring to the table to address these specific needs. Um, and, and at that point, the, the attention is focused now on something that's much more comfortable for all parties involved, which is, you know, the reason that you're there in the first place, which is to meet whatever the need is. So. I like it. I like it. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, what about people who feel that they have been um, discriminated against because of their identity? Like, what would you say to them? Gosh, man, that's a loaded question. Yeah. So, oh, this is a tough one. And the reason that it's tough is because we have not made the progress that, that we need to make. You know, we've made a lot of progress in this area, but not, we're not where we need to be. Um, and so because of that, there are some limitations on what you can do if you're discriminated against. And so, so for example, right now, like, from a federal standpoint, we don't currently have a federal law protecting employees from discrimination based on sexual orientation or gender identity. So you're limited right there in that you don't really have that federal um, protection in place. And that causes you to have to rely upon state level protections. Um, and there's a lot of work to be done there too. So like 28 out of 50 states have no state level protections for individuals being discriminated yeah. against based on sexual orientation. So literally more than half of our states don't have protection for discrimination based on sexual orientation. So you don't really have any recourse in those 28 states. And 30 out of our 50 states don't have any state level protections for gender identity. Um, and so you're really limited oftentimes in, in what recourse you have. So then that puts us in a position, and I hope you don't mind the way I answer questions. I kind of like to work my way back. No, <laughs> right. I do it the same way, so I get yeah. it. <laughs> so then that puts us in a position where if you can't rely on the federal government and you can't rely on the state, then you are having to rely on specific organizations and their policies and their procedures and what they have in place. And that's probably going to be your best course of action to start off with. Sometimes individuals are um, discriminating against you in a culture that overall does not agree with or does not tolerate discrimination. So you need to figure out what the policies are for your specific organization and that's going to be where you want to start. Now we have made a lot of progress there. So I think in 1996 it was, there was 4% 
of the Fortune 500 companies that had non-discrimination policies based on sexual orientation. You heard me right, I said four, not 40, four. In 1996, four percent of, of the Fortune 500 okay. companies had something in their policy that says you cannot discriminate against someone because of their sexual orientation. Now, if you fast forward to 2017, we've made so much progress. Literally 92% of Fortune 500 companies have policies that say you cannot discriminate based on sexual orientation. So while you might not have protections at the federal or the state level, if you're in a company that is, you know, medium to large size at all, there's likely some type of a non-discrimination policy that will protect you based on sexual orientation. And we've also made a lot of progress in terms of gender identity. There's still work to be done, but as recently as, I want to say 2002, there was only 3%, only 3% of Fortune 500 companies had a policy in place that protected people based on gender identity and said you can't discriminate based on gender identity. There's 3%. That's as recent as 2002. Well, now fast forward to 2017 and 82% of Fortune 500 companies have a policy in place that say you cannot discriminate based on gender identity. So with that being the case, if you feel like you've been discriminated against, you might not have much in the way of legal recourse, but I would strongly encourage you to go to the human resources professional in your organization because it's likely that there is something in place that says we can't discriminate based on that. Um, Now, if you do fall into a situation where there are those protections in place, um, in your specific organization and they still discriminate against you or you're in one of those states where there are protections in place and they discriminate against you, there are some legal um, you know, remedies or avenues. Um, and I, I always want to encourage people first to try to, to, try to talk to people. I, mean, I think litigation should always yeah. be the last resort. I mean, litigation, I feel, and this is just my personal opinion, should be after you've done everything you can possibly do um, and there's no other recourse. Then in that case, um, I would say, I, I would probably say contact the ACLU. They've done a lot of work around um, sexual orientation and gender identity and discrimination and they've been working with the LGBTQ population for a really, really long time. So you can contact okay. um, the ACLU, that would be, but that would be the last resort. I would say first thing would be go find out the policies and the procedures And here's the thing. Here's the thing. I'm a firm believer that it's hard to hate up close. And it's hard. Uh, It's hard to hate up close. When something is distant and far away and scary, it's really, really easy to just kind of other other it, right? You say like, oh, this scary thing over there that we need to get rid of. But it's hard to hate up close. So if you have an opportunity to actually engage with someone in a meaningful way, to just sit down with them human to human and say, hey, this is what I'm experiencing. I'm just like you. I just want to come to work every day and do a good job. I'm just like you. I want us to meet budget or I want us to provide the best quality care or I want us to meet these these metrics. I, I want to do the same thing you do. And I'm just trying to have a safe space to do that. And it's hard to hate up close. It's ah, really hard. And so I would say start there. Start there. Start with human interaction. And you'd be surprised how far that'll get you. Okay. Okay. All right. And um, so let's, let's go to some tactical things um, that I'm sure people would love to, to know how to handle. Okay. Could you share some foundational career advice to the trans community? Like, um, should you use your preferred name or legal name on your resume or, or other similar to that? Yeah. So this, this is one of those things that I think is going to have to do with each individual and their level of comfort. Um, so, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to take up too much time. I feel like I could talk to you forever, but I don't want to take up too much time. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. <laughs> I don't want to take up too much time. But so I want to kind of, I think this is really important. There's a, a really important distinction I want to make. So when it comes to coming out, so a lot of times people, when they think about coming out, they're thinking about sexual orientation because that's basically what we've come to understand it to be. And And the LGBTQ community oftentimes coming out is seen as like this big, beautiful, liberating thing. You know, it's, it's me showing you who I really am and you accepting me for who I really am. And for a lot of people in the lesbian, gay and bisexual community, 
that's um, one of the goals is to get to a place where you come out and you're accepted. Well, you have to really be careful taking that and applying that same perspective to the transgender community. Because for the transgender community, oftentimes it is the exact opposite. Whereas for the lesbian, gay, and bisexual community, I want to show up and I'm saying, this is who I really am and I want you to receive me for who I am. Oftentimes in the transgender community, what the desire is, is not for me to broadcast, this is my gender assigned at birth, but this is who I present as and I want you to love me anyway, but it's actually to pass, right? Which means there would be no discussion had because there would be no discussion had. So those are two very different things. And so we've, we've got to kind of be careful when we look at that. So when we look at, so what is the end goal? If I'm coming into a space and I'm lesbian, gay, and bisexual, I might want you to know right away. And I might want to know that you're going to accept me anyway. Well, if I come into a space and I'm transgender, I might not want that conversation to ever take place because the goal might be that I came in and it was never a needed conversation. Does that right. make sense? Right. Uh So if I bind my Uh chest and I wear my tie and I put on my sweater vest, my end goal might very well be that you never even think about it. Right. That you just (laughs) assumed that I am who I know I am. Right. And I I go to the men's restroom and I do this and I do that and no one thinks twice. Right. Right. And so those are two very, very different things. And so when we're thinking about being supportive and affirming and creating affirming spaces, we got to really, really be careful because if we're looking at people that are lesbian, gay, and bisexual, creating an affirming space might very well be, hey, I see you for who you are and I accept you. Whereas if we're dealing with someone that's transgender, it might very well be that that never comes up at all because why would it? <laughs> right. Like, right. No. So that's that's the way you broke that distinction. Does that make sense? Does it, uh-huh. 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 Distinction? Yeah. The yeah. Work that done. Um, which leads me to the, the next question. So at what point do you recommend, so if I'm in the process of transitioning, I have a job interview coming up, what point do you recommend I share this if at all with the recruiter or hiring manager? Yeah, yeah man. Gosh. Okay, so first things first, um, I mean, it's going to have to do a lot with the culture of the environment that you're entering into. Um, hmm. You've got to really be careful you've got to really be careful not to, gosh, this comes back to kind of that, what you were saying earlier about distraction, right? Like to what extent is that relevant and how much of that is just a distraction from what we really need to be talking about, right? Like, so I think if there's a reason that I need to share that with you, right? Like maybe I need to have an understanding of, the medical benefits and whether they are going to cover medical costs associated with transition. Like that might be a reason that I might bring that up, or maybe I need to understand, you know, um, partner benefits or something like that. So I think what I'm saying is I would take a step back and I would ask, and this is going to be different for every person, but I would take a step back and I would ask what need am I meeting by disclosing this right now, right? Mm -hmm. And if you can identify the need and it's necessary to disclose it, then I would say, by all means, go ahead and disclose it. If it's difficult to identify the need or if the need is I need to be accepted, then you might want to take a step back and think about that a little bit further before you move forward because there can be some fallout associated with that. And so um, If the need is, I want people to know me and accept me, I would say, take a step back and think, do I need to get this need met in the workplace? Is this where I need to get this need met? Or is this something that I could more appropriately get met outside of here? Like, is it really my coworker's job to meet that need? But if it's a need that is somehow related to my work, then I would say absolutely move forward with that. And that's not to say that you won't ever get to a place where you um, begin to think more about your social needs in the workplace, but that's probably not something that you want to focus on at the very beginning. I think in the very beginning, you want to think about how do I contribute to this organization? And, mm-hmm. um, and so then that needs to be your focus. And, you know, you can worry about the, the coffee or the, uh, what do they call it? The water cooler talk 
uh, after you're actually in the door. Um, so once you get the jab, <laughs> once you get the jab. So you got to be careful. I mean, that's and 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 that's not the answer necessarily for everyone. And I, I you know, I. But if I were just to say for me, I would say I would want to get in the door, um, and it's hard to hate up close, man. I, I'd want to get in the door, and then once I'm in the door and I'm showing that I'm able to do the work and I'm showing that I'm a team player, then if I begin to feel like that's an important part of um, our relationship in this setting, then we can move forward and disclose at that time. But I would be really cautious um, not to – perhaps lose opportunities because I put that at the forefront and make that what's most important in the beginning. That makes sense. That makes sense. And, um, and I've heard you talk about pronouns um, yes. in the past, and I, and I love this, I love this conversation, so I'm going to bring it up here. Um, so let's say I'm in a situation where I now need to talk to the employer about wanting to be addressed as he instead of she or want to be addressed be addressed as she instead of he. How do I bring up that conversation during an interview? So I haven't even gotten the job yet. Yes. <laughs> How do I bring this up during an interview? Yeah. So listen, when it comes to pronouns, I think that one of the best things that you can do is just be direct um, and, and just forthcoming right from the beginning. Right. You don't want it to be one of those things where someone's been misgendering you for an hour and then you say, oh, by the way, I would rather if you said, don't do that, because then that makes for a really awkward and weird situation. So I would, I personally would recommend that from the very beginning, you go ahead and introduce what your pronouns are. And that can happen one of two ways, right? You can introduce yourself and you can offer up your pronouns at that time. Or when um, the very first time that someone genders you, and they will, because it just happens naturally in conversation, you can very gently kind of correct. The very first time it comes out, but don't let it go on for like 30, 40 minutes and then say something then. Because what happens is then people go back and they think about all the times they was gendered you and then they feel bad and it's awkward and it's weird and it's just... It's a distraction. And it's a distraction, distraction right? <laughs> right? So you want to come in and you want to say, hi, you know, my name's Dr. Folks. You know, um, you know, my preferred pronouns are he, him, his. You can say it right there from the beginning. Or the very first time someone says she, right, it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen. It's inevitable. Very first time they say it. Right, then my response would be like, you know, oh, I actually, my pronouns are he, him, his. Um, and I actually, oh my gosh, so I just said preferred pronoun, we weren't going to get me started on that. But there's, <laughs> I'll just say that um, just as an aside, and I, and I have to work on that too, like I just said it myself, I'm, I'm working on not saying preferred pronouns because pronouns really aren't a matter of preference. It's just a statement of fact. Oh. And so I'm working on that. So that's me holding myself accountable because I'm working on not saying preferred pronouns because they're not my preferred pronouns. They're just my pronouns. It's a pronoun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So mm -hmm. makes sense. That's, makes sense. that's me holding myself accountable on your podcast. So, <laughs> so hi, my name is Dr. Folks, and my pronouns are, not my preferred, but my pronouns yeah. are. <laughs> there you go. See, I, I'm, I'm loving you. So um, let's, let's talk about trans-friendly employers. Is if I'm looking for a job and I want to know, you know, what are the best companies for me to go and work at? Yes. Uh, what are some signs? What should I be looking for in general? Yeah, well, okay, so word of mouth is, is always great. That's first things first is if you're a member of the trans community and, you know, you've got friends out there, what are the environments that they work in? And if they're um, raving about how welcoming an environment they work in, that's that's first-hand knowledge is always best. Um, but then there's also, you can use the Google machine. Uh, there are lots and lots <laughs> of uh, lots of sites out there that are dedicated to, you know, letting people know what environments are accepting and not accepting. So you can definitely do that. Um, another way would be to familiarize yourself. If it's an organization where you can't have any access to um, their policies or their standing on anything, you can familiarize yourself with policies. Obviously, um, though, the, the best, because there's policy and then there's like what we actually do. And sometimes those things mm -hmm. align and sometimes they don't. And in an ideal world, right, in the utopia in my mind, those things would always align, but that's not always the case. So it's, if it's at all possible for you to speak to someone who works in a specific environment or works for a specific company and you're able to get firsthand information of how they feel they're treated, that would always be uh, best. And then you can, uh, if you don't have access to that, 
you can use the, the Google machine, use the interwebs to uh, <laughs> see what other people have to say about the environment. So, yeah. Okay. 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 And I realize I have so many other questions for you, so we're going to keep moving right, <laughs> right along. Because these yeah. are some good questions. Your answers are amazing. Okay. So you mentioned before in an earlier conversation about, um, the, you know, you already have the, 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 the things that we're faced with when getting a job, and now you're in the workplace, okay? So one of the things that you hear a lot of conversations about now are restrooms yes. in the workplace. Yes. What sort of um, advice or tips do you have around someone who's, who's thinking, you know, how do I address this whole workplace restroom thing? Yes. Okay. So um, first things first, I would definitely say human resources is the place to start. Human resources is the place to start. You've got to figure out what your company's uh, line is in terms of creating inclusive and affirming environments. Um, so you definitely want to start there. One of the things, if you're an employer, there are ways that you can address this situation uh, that make things a lot less um, uncomfortable, which would be to have either non-gendered restrooms or to make sure that you have uh, single stall uh, restrooms available, stuff like that, where an individual can go and use, like, you know, like you go somewhere and there's a restroom and it's got like, a male, a female, a baby. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, it's got, like every mm -hmm. option, like on the, on the thing, you know. Um, you know, I've having a restroom is like, like whatever, like that's fine. I saw a restroom sign once, which I love, which I think I'm going to just get the sign and put it in my office. Like it literally just has like, I don't even know what the picture is. You can't tell. Maybe that's the point. But then it just says, whatever, just make sure you wash your hands. <laughs> I like that. I like it yes. a lot. <laughs> so, so oh, one thing you can do as an employer is, you know, make it not a big deal by making sure that everyone knows anyone can use restrooms. So where I'm at, it's funny, we have, um, the restrooms actually are uh, gendered just because we haven't changed it, but we all know that it doesn't mean anything. And so you just go to whatever bathroom is available and then no one really cares. Okay. Um, but so you can create non-gendered bathrooms. That's one thing you can do as an employer. Um, or you can make sure at the very least that you have an option that is a standalone restroom so that someone is not in a position where they feel like they have to go and be in a position where they're uncomfortable. Um, but one thing that you don't want to do, and I, it's so funny, I was having this conversation with someone just the other day. They were talking about their employer and um, effort that they were making to try to make someone comfortable but it kind of backfire. Yeah. Like, and that's, it, this is where it's, I think important to actually speak to employees and see what that would make them comfortable. I think sometimes we sit, you know, up high somewhere and we make these decisions, uh, what we think is best without actually getting the feedback of the employees. And so there was a lady, it was a trans woman who was working for an employer and um, she they were getting some, I guess, complaints about her using the female restroom. Um, but she didn't feel comfortable using the male restroom, right? Which is, that's fair. And so what they did is they basically like built her, it's like not like a stall, but like a bathroom inside of the men's restroom so that she could have her own restroom, but she had to go in the men's restroom to get to her stall that had been converted into her own special restroom so that she would become missing the point, which it's, is yes, the whole point, which yeah. is very, very uncomfortable. And so then everyone was scratching their heads because she was still using the female restroom. And they're like, well, we made, but we made this special restroom just for you. And, but, but she had to go into the men's restroom to get to yeah. her restroom. So, so speak to your employees and figure out what is it that we could do what, what could we do to make this comfortable for you? Um, and then if it's, if it's a reasonable thing and it's something you can accommodate, then do that. Now, if you are the employee, then I would say, like I said, going to human resources and saying, hey, you know, I actually, I don't feel comfortable using this restroom. I feel more comfortable using that restroom. And I just would like to have the support of the, the company and organization in doing that. Um, and you'd be surprised, again, how far it goes just to sit down and have a conversation with someone and say, hey, because at the end of the day, 
everyone can understand wanting to use the restroom in a space that's comfortable um, and being afforded the privacy that, you know, we all desire when toiletting. Um, so, right. okay. yeah, and so I think just having that conversation uh, goes a long way. Did I answer okay. your question? Uh, you sure did. Okay. You sure did. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, and you, you were talking about, as a way of answering the question, you were talking about leadership, which is a great transition into the next topic or question that I have for you, um, transgender professionals and leadership. So what if I'm that person that's listening to this podcast and, and I'm saying, you know, well, I don't see anyone that looks like me in leadership. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what are my chances of ever climbing the ladder? And especially with the stigma that, that you were saying earlier, what career advice would you give to someone wanting to climb the corporate ladder when no one looks like them? Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, that's perfect. That's perfect. So what I would say, and we, we spoke about this earlier, uh, competence, you, you got to be the best that you, that you can be. So that's mm -hmm. a given. I'm not going to talk about that again, but that's a given. Understand mm -hmm. that that's a prerequisite for any of this other stuff to work. You got to be competent. Okay. All right. Um, but what I would say is that mentorship is critical. You might not have someone in your immediate surrounding that looks like you, but there's someone that looks like you that does what it is that you want to do. And the onus is on you to find them and ask them to mentor you, right? This is, again, that comes down to, do you have the willingness to go to work and then get off work and go to work, right? Mm -hmm. the, the reason I say that is because if you can align yourself with someone who has already gone through the process, you can literally take years off of the amount of time that it takes you to move up and grow professionally. A lot of times we waste a lot of time reinventing the wheel and figuring it out and stumbling and fumbling for no reason. Like I'm a firm believer that you don't have to run into a wall to know it's hard. Okay. Like it's just, <laughs> right. it's just not necessary. Right. Right. So if I can find someone and align myself with someone who's gone through this process and been successful, then that's what I want to do. Now in my immediate organization, that might not be available to me, but go on, you'd be surprised, go online, go online and find the person that looks like you that's doing what it is that you want to do and reach out to them. Here's the other thing. A lot of times people don't reach out because uh, they're, they're concerned. I don't know about rejection or maybe they don't understand the value in mentorship. I don't know what it is, but I can tell you that in most instances, it's been my experience that when I've reached out to someone and said, would you be willing to mentor me? Nine times out of 10, they've been Thank like, you. yeah. Sure. And so I think that there's kind of this, it's, it's scary unnecessarily, you know, because most people are gracious enough to say, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't be where I am right now if someone hadn't mentored me so I can mentor you. Sure. Why not? You know? Um, and so we talk to those people. Another thing I would say is aim high. All right. And this is something that I think a lot of people get wrong is they identify the person that is just above where they are that's at the very next level. And they say, let me reach out to them and figure out how they got there. No, 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 no. That's right. Don't do it. You want to go all the way to the top, right? So whatever it is that you want to be, like you want to find the best, I mean, the baddest, the most amazing that ever did it, right? Go all the way to the top, The all the way to the, like, I want you to think this is absurd. They would never talk to me. That person, that's the person I want you to reach out to. It, it was so interesting about what you're saying, Dr. Folks, is that um, that was my mindset when I was in corporate America. And, and my thought was, who is the epitome of success at this company? Yes. Who is this person? That's the person that I want to mentor yes. me. And I yes. actually went to the CFO. And there I told you her. That I wanted her to be my mentor. And sometimes this whole mentoring relationship, it may look differently, you know, mm -hmm. just depending on how busy somebody is. And mm -hmm. sometimes you have to be more proactive and accountable. Yes. But it's okay yes. because now I'm on your schedule and now yes. we're on a regular yes. basis. Right. And so when you say don't go up to the next level, you shoot as high as you can to the stars. Mm -hmm. I completely agree with that. 100%. You know, I tell people, you know, don't, don't go to the next level and then try to work your way up. Go to the very top and work your way down, right? So you go to the very, very top. And if the person at the very top says, I'm sorry, I really just can't, 
then you say, I understand. And then you ask again because you're persistent, right? But anyway, like, <laughs> so, so be persistent. Don't be a stalker. Be persistent. Okay, There's a difference. Right. Okay. All right. So you go to the very top and they might say, you know, they might kind of say, uh, and shoo you away the first time because a lot mm -hmm. of people come to them. Right. But yeah. not a lot of people circle back around. So here's, here's, the, here we go. Here's another moment. All right. Let's so do it. Okay. Number one, there's not as many people seeking their time as you would think there are because most people talk themselves out of it. That's number one. But then of those that do seek their time, right? Very few of any of them will circle back around after the first denial. So you be that person that gets that first denial, right? And then respectfully circle back around and say, I understand that you're busy. Could I, could I offer this instead? I mean, perhaps we could, you know, I can fit into your schedule in this way. It, we can do it online. We can, on the phone. I, as a matter of fact, I mean, whatever it worked for you. I actually have said before, and I kid you not, I've not had anyone take me up on this offer. Thank goodness, because at the time, financially, I have no idea how I would pull this off. But I, it sounded good at the time. And I was, I was, I was ready. I was going to figure it out. I reached out to someone once who was in Hong Kong, who was like at the pinnacle, like they, like when I thought of this is someone, you know, um, in my consultant work, this is someone who's doing what I want to do. Like, I want to do what she is doing, but she is killing it. So I reach out to her. She's in Hong Kong, right? And, and I'm like, you know, will you mentor me? Da, da, da. And, you know, you get the little bit of a runner. Oh, you know, I'm busy and I'm this, mm -hmm. that. And I said, and I, I'm, not even, I'm not even kidding. I said, listen, I, I am willing to, to fly all the way out to Hong Kong just so I can take you to lunch. Can I take you to lunch and just have a lunch with you and just – if you could share whatever information you could in the period of a lunch, I'll take that. I just really, really want to learn from you. And she, and she responded and she was like, that won't be necessary. Um, huh, let me, let me put you on my calendar. <laughs> that just gave you goosebumps. <laughs> yes, yes. And I have literally, thank goodness she didn't take me up on the offer because I could not have afforded a flight to Hong Kong. <laughs> I don't know what I would have done if she would have said, yeah, take me to lunch on Wednesday. I have no idea. I would have been making a right. GoFundMe account or something. Right. right. <laughs> but, but, I was, me, though. but I was like, hey, listen, can I just take you to lunch? I'll, listen, I will fly from the United States to Hong Kong just to take you to lunch. But I, I want to learn from you. And, and she, she didn't said, know you prior to then? I'm sorry? And she didn't know you prior no, to then? No, no. She didn't know me prior to that. I had just reached out and was like, I like and, I, and I, but I had done my homework and I, I knew her work and I was able to reference her work and the things that she'd done that were uh, inspirational to me. And I saw the way that you did X, Y, and Z. And that's exactly what I would like to do. That's what I would like to accomplish. And I know you're busy. I'll come to you. I'll come to you. And just, you got to eat anyway, right? Can I sit next to you while you do it? <laughs> you <know>? Exactly. <laughs> and she was like, you know what? Okay. Uh, that won't be necessary. And she put me on her schedule. And then as a matter of fact, we actually ended up doing some work together uh, in the future. She actually reached out to me fast forward, maybe nine months later and said, Hey, I've got some work in the States. I need a, an LGBTQ expert. You want to do some, some work for me? And I was like, see, see, that's how <laughs> it happens. The door, right. Um, <laughs> and and, and right. now we have a pretty close relationship. So I would say, I say that to say mentorship is everything, you know, it's, it will take a lot of the time and a lot of the pain out of the process for you. I mean, you're still going to run into rough times. You're still going to have to go through the work of growth and the growing pains, but there's a lot that you can avoid by way of mentorship. And that would encourage people to go all the way to the top, say, I want, I want the best of the best and listen and, and, and be willing to be willing to say that. Like, I don't mind seeing someone who is amazing and telling them they're amazing. You know, they're all, listen, you, right. you are amazing. And mm -hmm. I, I want to figure out how to do that. Would you be willing to mentor me? And you'd be surprised. I mean, I've, I'm, I, I, it's difficult for me to think of a time that I've had someone uh, decline, um, especially the second time. Cause I, cause I'm that person that will circle <laughs> back. <laughs> Oh my goodness. No, that, that was, that's a really, really good story. A really good story. Um, and 
so I know that we're going to have to invite you back again because we have so many other things to talk about. But I, I do need to wrap it up. So with, with two questions, and then I have a whole thing over here for you. But okay. um, I want to talk about support resources. You had, we had started talking about it a second ago, but what resources would you recommend to people that help to support trans professionals in finding employment, navigating the workplace? Do you have any recommendations? Uh, yeah, the Human Rights Campaign has a ton of really, really great information out there for both um, people that are seeking employment and then for those employers and, and, and the workforce. Um, and so the Human Rights Campaign has a lot of great stuff. GLAAD has a lot of great stuff. Um, there are, there's, uh, there's, that's just the stuff that's right here in the U.S., but even if you were to kind of ex expand your reach a little bit more, there's a lot of stuff internationally too. So I would say the, the internet, I mean, there's no, there's so many resources online now um, okay. that you can basically get any question that you have answered. Um, I think human rights campaign, me personally, I think human rights campaign is, is, is my first stop uh, oftentimes to see what they have. And then I go from there. So. Okay. Okay. Do you have any final tips for transgender job seekers that you didn't talk about? I didn't ask about, but you really, really want this population to hear. Yeah, um, I, I, want, I want you to know um, that it's possible, that it can happen, that, that you can be successful, that it gets better, right? If it's been a struggle, you know, hang in there, keep going, keep showing up, keep showing up, keep showing up, keep showing up. Um, and eventually it gets better. You know, I, when I started college, like I shared, I was homeless and I've, I have worked my way up um, and I've, I've had a willingness to take that leap of faith and I would encourage people to, to have that willingness too. Sometimes opportunities will present themselves and you might not know exactly, you know, how you're going to do it or what you're going to do, but it seems like a good opportunity. And, you know, I've done that multiple times in my career where I've, I've, I've taken that leap um, and I've, I've landed <laughs> in pretty good places. And so I would just encourage people, I guess, more than anything to keep going and to know that there are things that you can do out there. Um, there are spaces that you can work that are affirming and supportive. One of the things that we didn't really get a chance to talk very much about is just some of the economic hardship that people in the transgender mm -hmm. community experience um, because of disenfranchisement, because of the, the high, high unemployment rates. And so when like how does that trickle down like how does that impact you know your life and quality of life and it does it absolutely does so for example when we look at like home ownership for example i think it's i want to say 63 percent of the u.s population you know enjoys home ownership and and um that's a that's a huge thing so it's a, that's a huge chunk of the population that owns a home well in the transgender community it's 16 percent wow um, that's a massive discrepancy and it might not seem like a big deal, but that's a huge deal in terms of pride, mm -hmm. and honor and stability. Right. And so I guess, I guess what I'm trying to say is I'm sensitive to the fact that everyone doesn't look like me. I, I am, I recognize my privilege. Like I was having this conversation the other day with someone and I'm like, yeah, I'm black, I'm trans and I'm all that. But I also have a PhD, you know, I'm a hospital administrator, you know, when I, when I walk into a space, you know, there with that comes a great deal of authority and I recognize my privilege and I recognize that there's so many people in my community that that's not their lived experience. You know, I understand that, that, you know, economic hardship is the lived experience for so many people in my community. And so I, more than anything, what I want you to know is that I see you and that, I love you and I affirm you and it gets better and you just have to keep going, put in the work, find someone who's doing what it is that you want to do, ask them to mentor you and know that it gets better. And it doesn't matter what you've had to do to support yourself so far. And that's another thing, you know, there's a lot of individuals sadly that have had to rely on underground, the underground economy to take care of themselves mm -hmm. because it's so difficult to get employment um, so, like, for example, I think it's 12% of transgender individuals that will engage in sex work 
at some courts in their life to make income so they can take care of themselves. 9% engage in sex work within the last year to take care of themselves. So what I'm saying to you, um, I'm just, I'm just hoping, I'm hoping that there's going to be someone out here that's going to see this, going to be a transgender person that's going to see this. This is what I want you to know. It doesn't matter what you've had to do to make it. It doesn't matter, you know, what you, uh, what bridges you've had to cross before. Tomorrow's a new day. It gets better. Decide what you want to be and go be it. Figure out what it takes and do that. Get the credentialing, get the licensure, get the education, do the apprenticeship, get the mentor, decide what to be and go be it. And I'm telling you, if you're willing to put in the work, you can get there. And I'm, I'm living testament to that. Okay. Like you can do this. I believe in you. I see you. I affirm you. You got this. So I think that's what I would want. That's what I want to share uh, is it gets better. Beautiful. And thank you for sharing that as well too. So where can people find you? If someone's saying I need to find Dr. Folk, um, yeah. where can they find you? What are you up to over there? Oh my gosh. So, uh, so my website um, is folksconsulting.com. That's F as in Frank. O W L K E S. So you can check me out there. Um, LinkedIn is probably the social media site that I'm most active on. Um, and it's Ashley C folks is I think my handle on LinkedIn. That's A S H L E E C folks. Um, so you can find me there. And I, I, I post videos and stuff on LinkedIn for business professionals. I've got a series called the don't be that person series. <laughs> <laughs> That, that that's, gives, that's how I saw the pronoun video. I think that's, that's, yes. that's where I saw it. Yes. 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 <laughs> that has to do with, you know, the mm -hmm. do's and don'ts of interacting with transgender people. Uh, so I've got a don't be that person series. Um, <laughs> so you can definitely look at LinkedIn and you can find uh, some of my latest work there. I, I, right now I'm doing a lot of consultant work. Um, I'm also a hospital administrator, but I'm doing a lot of consulting these days. And so, um, you can find me there to see what I'm doing. Or if you think that your organization might benefit from having an LGBTQ expert do some consultation, um, you know, reach out to me. You know, I, what I want more than anything is to help create affirming spaces for people. We spend so much of our waking hours at work that if right. you don't work in a supportive affirming space, like that's a quality of life issue. So you know, if, if okay. we can make a difference, one company, one organization at a time, um, that's what it's all about. That's what I want to do. So, yeah. Love it. Okay. Um, I'm podcasting with one of our other guests where we do flash questions. So, oh. I'm going to ask, <laughs> so I'm going to ask you three questions, okay. and I want to know the first thing that comes to mind for you, okay? Okay. All right. Uh, the first it's never too late to succeed I get inspired by seeing others that look like me be successful career success means being able to show up as my authentic self and using my influence to allow others to show up as their authentic self awesome Dr. Folks, it's great having you on the show, and um, I, I appreciate you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, this has been wonderful. I love the work that you're doing. This is, this is huge. Um, and I, I want you to know that you are making a difference. Keep it up. People need this. So um, kudos to you. Thank you. I appreciate that. hope you enjoyed today's show. Be sure to tune in next week because we have so much more in store for you. Until next time, keep going, keep growing, and keep glowing.